so uh, first of all, David, thanks so much for making the time to chat with us. This is very uh, exciting. Can I start by asking you how you've adjusted? You know, I mean, uh, to the work and to the routine, but also just something as simple as, as getting around. You know, it's uh, it doesn't come natural, doesn't come quickly. It uh, in my case took several weeks, but uh, yes, I did uh, eventually adjust physically completely. And there's also some mental adjustments, psychological adjustments, uh, sense of disorientation initially, both in time and in space. Learning to fly has been the most important thing, I guess. Learning to you know move around using your feet and your hands without breaking anything and uh, without taking anything off the walls. Initially, when you see rookies come in, we kind of very slowly move, and yet we bang things around. Now you kind of, without thinking about it, you just push yourself in the right direction and float through the modules. You have to learn not to lose things, because everything wants to fly away from you. Uh, so we have all these tricks. And then mentally, getting to get in the routine of staying in contact with people you love on the planet and remaining functional up here. All these things uh, take time. But thankfully, we have this overlapping system where we come on board, and there's always crews that have been here for several months and they just take us by the hand and hand us over the baton if you want. <laughs> you make it sound so simple. Uh, could you take a moment, though, to reflect perhaps on the road that brought you to where you, and that's very cool, by the way, uh, the road that brought you to where you are now. I mean, you look around and you think back to being a boy with, with dreams of being an astronaut to where you are today. Yeah, yeah my road started, uh, like everybody, as a young boy. You know, these dreams, I think, we should never forget that our, our main resource as a country is uh, in the heads of our children. Uh, they, are, they hold our future. And so this dream for me has always been like a guiding, a vague, it's been like a star, like the North Star. The North Star, you, you never get there, but it can still be a guide, right? So I always thought space was an inspiration. I might never get there, it doesn't matter. At least it kind of gave me a path, it gave me a direction to follow. It gave me criteria to make decisions in life about what to do with my time on Earth. I was careful to make decisions that make me happy every time. And if you have to move, then you move and life will lead you where it, where it will. And if every choice was a good choice that made sense at the time, then the end result is a good result. You know, in, in an interview uh, some time ago, you mentioned that a skill you had to acquire to be an astronaut was, was how to think like an astronaut. But you said that while you're here on Earth. So, so now that you've had a few months up in space, I'm wondering if you can, you can explain that a bit for me. How does an astronaut think differently than anyone else? Well, maybe not differently than anyone else, but we, we think we have an operational mindset, which means that what we do here, you know, you see me here, I'm breathing, it's comfortable, good temperature, uh, the food is decent, we can sleep, but we are one technical problem away from being very uncomfortable, potentially, uh, or worse. Uh, and so you're constantly aware that you are living in a life support system and you have to be very careful everything you do. So there is a sense of a kind of, a, if you want, respect for all the work that goes around us. And we are supported by thousands of people over dozens of years uh, to make this incredible life support system possible. The entire station is a one huge life support system. And we are kind of given the keys to the, the world's spacecraft. And uh, you gotta be responsible for it. You gotta uh, be very diligent. I mean, but isn't that terrifying in a way? I mean, I, and, and I'll give you an example. I mean, a month ago, you know, I understand a toilet leaked uh, on board, you know, something like 10 liters of water spilling out. Oh, we have a space plumber. Yes, the, the, the uh, the only problem is I can't call a professional plumber if I need help. Oh, you are a professional. Call the ground. <laughs> you should have your toilet bag in about an hour. Here on Earth, we call that a bad afternoon, but to your point, on board the ISS, that's a potentially catastrophic problem. I mean, do you often think about just how, how fragile, the, the delicate nature of your mission? You know, it's interesting how the human mind works. I think. Uh, that uh, notion that uh, you're one, fa one problem away from, a, from being very uncomfortable, it kind of changed your mindset, but naturally you want to be at peace. You want, everybody wants to be peaceful. So we kind of change our, our set point. So, you know, it's not like I live in constant fear. I just li I'm just very aware of my environment, I guess I would say. That's what it does. It makes you very, very aware, acutely aware of everything. And as we get to know space station better and better, I mean, it's full of cables and machines. We kind of more and more efficiently notice whenever something is out of normal configuration. And that's, that's the best you can do. Uh. 
You also recently oversaw the successful docking of the SpaceX Dragon capsule with the International Space Station, which was, you know, a, a very real example of what future manned space travel could look like. And you were the first one to go inside the capsule. So I'm wondering, as you were doing that, what were you thinking? I was thinking about my procedures because I was doing some things that had never been done before. These procedures, the first time they were executed. Eastern station on one, no two, forward hatch open. For me, certainly the first time for me. So I was just, I had, I had my operational hat on, if you want, making sure I was doing things the right way. And then, but when I opened the hatch, my the first thought that came to my mind was like, oh, wow, this looks different. You know what? I thought, oh, this looks like a business class uh, section <laughs> of an airplane. <laughs> but, okay, but, but I also, you know, I think of that and I think of Canada's uh, recent announcement about the Lunar Gateway Project, right? Having a space station orbit the moon. What is it that excites you most about the future of space? You know... It's a good question. I mean, I'm very excited about all these prospects of us continuing our, our inner desire to explore, expand our horizons and understand the world around us. I mean, that's what literally what got us out of the caves, through the plains, up the mountains, and then all the valley, on the oceans, in the air. And so there's that aspect. We have to continue to explore because that's in our nature and that's how we progress, you know? I think. Uh, it will never be the priority of humanity, of course. Priorities will always remain health, education, employment, security, peace, all that. But we have to keep a small fraction of our energy for blue sky dreaming, for the arts, for science, and for exploration, because that is how we grow. That is how we develop our civilization. So what excites me most is not the fact that we are going deeper into space, it's looking at my kids, knowing the fact that, yeah, Canada is continuing. Canada is keeping uh, staying at the forefront of innovation, exploration. That's the kind of country that I'm proud to give to my kids. Because you know, these decisions on space projects, they're always for the next generation. It's decades away. That being said, um, do you miss home, David? Every day, every day. But you know, it's interesting. I was worried that I was gonna miss nature and because we're living in this technical environment. But every day, looking at the Earth from the cupola, poof, it's this, I mean, it's nature at its best. It's, it beats the view you have from any mountaintop, if you want. So uh, you are like in awe of natural beauty whenever you look outside the window through our planet. So that aspect is okay. But of course, I miss the ones I love. I miss my wife, my children, my parents, my brothers, my friends. Um, I miss... Uh, Everybody in Houston who have made it possible to bring me here, people who have trained us, people who are constantly working diligently in mission control. I miss the community uh, of humans, but the connection is still there. We don't feel lonely. Uh, you just, I just wish I could uh, hug my kids from time to time. You know, uh, things like that, but we're not here forever. We'll be back. <laughs> and we'll be back with lots of stories to tell, and it, uh, it is a great adventure. Well, and, and humanity will welcome you back. Uh, David, what a wonderful opportunity it was to have this chat with you. Thank you so much for taking the time, and we wish you all the best. Thank you, Andrew. Bye, everybody.